On March 8, 2001, STS-102, flown by Space Shuttle Discovery, launched from Kennedy Space Center to the International Space Station. Go for main engine. Three, two. of Discovery and a team of explorers shaping their destiny. Roll program Houston. Roger, roll Discovery. Houston is now controlling. The roll maneuver is complete and Discovery is now in a heads down, wings level position, carrying the next resident crew to the International Space Station. seconds into the flight. Discovery's engines are now throttling down to 72% of rated thrust as it passes through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Discovery already at an altitude of five and a half miles. Discovery, go at throttle up. And Discovery's three liquid-fueled main engines are now back at full throttle, 104% of rated thrust. One and a half minutes into flight. Discovery has now expended two and a half million pounds of propellant. It weighs less than half of what it did at the time of its liftoff. Now at an altitude of 19 miles, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at 17 miles. Two minutes into the flight. And the booster officer here in Mission Control confirms separation of the solid rocket boosters. On March 10th, after a two day rendezvous orbit, Discovery closed with the ISS and docked without incident. The primary objective of STS-102 was to supply the ISS and rotate the Expedition 1 crew with Expedition 2. Expedition 2 was made up of one Russian, Commander Yuri Yusichev, and two American flight engineers, Susan Helms and James Voss. One of the first goals of the mission was to move PMA-2 from the Nadir port on Unity to its port side using the Canadarm. Moving this module with the arm was uh, a relatively easy task even though it weighs many thousands of pounds. Uh, it may be weightless but it has mass. Uh, once it was on and latched onto the side of the station, we were able to release the remote manipulator system um, from the module. The mission then called for the removal of the multi-purpose logistics module, known as Leonardo, from the shuttle's cargo bay and berth it to the Nadir port on Unity. The module contained over 4,000 pounds of supplies for the Expedition 2 crew.
After birthing, the crew removes supplies from Leonardo and onto the station. You can see that the MPLM is really a spacious uh, module. It's, it's a lot bigger than uh, we were ready for it. Just, just a really well-built, uh, spacious uh, piece of gear. And uh, it's, it's going to serve us well in space station hauling stuff up and down, I'm sure. And here's uh, moving one of the, uh, I guess we moved about six racks. This is one of them we moved from the MPLM into the lab. It was tight, but it was very easy if you went slow to control it and make sure that, uh, I don't think we even put a scratch on it. After the transfer was complete, Leonardo was unberthed from the station and returned to the shuttle bay for a return back to Earth. After transferring command from the Expedition 1 to the Expedition 2 crew, now with William Shepard, Yuri Gidzenko, and Sergei Kirkulev, departed the station and landed back at Cape Kennedy on the 21st of March 2001. final approach for landing. Uh, we were trying to get a crosswind test. We had winds uh, up above the limits that we'd flown to before, and a couple of seconds prior to touchdown, the winds subsided, uh, came down less than the limit, and then right after touchdown, the winds picked up again. So we were either lucky or, or unlucky, depending upon your point of view. The vehicle does fly very well. It's very smooth, uh, very well designed by years ago. As we roll out, uh, Vegas Kelly, my trusty pilot, puts the drag chute out to help us slow down. We bring the vehicle coasting stop. It will fly one more time and then it'll go off to uh, Palmdale for refurbishment. A month into the Expedition 2 rotation, on April 16, 2001, Progress M44 undocked, deorbited, and burnt up in the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. After Progress M44 left, the Expedition 2 crew moved Soyuz TM31 from the Nadir port on the Zarya and back to the aft port of Svezda to clear the way for the next Soyuz mission. The next shuttle flight to the station was STS-100, flown by Space Shuttle Endeavour, which launched from Cape Canaveral on April 19, 2001. 10, 9, 8, we have a go for main engine start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour, extending the reach of the space station while extending partnerships above the Earth. Houston Endeavour roll program. Roger roll, Endeavour. Houston's now controlling. Endeavour's rolling on course toward the International Space Station. The shuttle already traveling more than 200 miles per hour. Endeavour's altitude now one and a half miles. It's speed now about 500 miles per hour. 
Three engines on board the spacecraft are throttling down to two-thirds throttle to prepare the shuttle to pass through the area of maximum air pressure and go supersonic. After a two-day orbit, Endeavour docked with the ISS. The primary objectives of STS-100 was the installation, activation, and checkout of the Canadarm2 robotic arm on the station. The arm, which went into operation on April 28, 2001, was critical to the capability to continue assembly of the International Space Station. The arm was also necessary to attach a new airlock, which would come up on STS-104. You're going to see Chris uh, back on the robotic arm, the shuttle's arm, with uh, Jeff driving it. And we're going to unfurl the arm at uh, uh, the midway point. And you can see it's just a, a huge uh, structure. And then we have uh, another view of uh, Chris at the end of the arm and a very rare view of our own orbiter. There's the uh, nose of the, uh, the shuttle Endeavour from his vantage point. We then had to insert uh, eight very special bolts that we called expandable diameter fastener uh, bolts. And these things uh, required a considerable amount of force. Uh, we used the uh, pistol grip tool that uh, Chris talked about earlier. Uh, used those and found that they weren't quite enough uh, to actually uh, rigidize the arm in place. So then we had to use uh, uh, brute strength and manually ratchet them. Here's uh, Chris's uh, pistol grip tool. And you can see it kicks back a little bit. In the lower left, you can see me actually manually ratcheting those bolts tight. And uh, this is one of my favorite shots. It's a picture of uh, Susan looking out of the fishbowl or maybe us looking back in, but a uh, rare view of uh, uh, folks on either end of the, uh, the lab. STS-102 was the first flight using the multi-purpose logistics module known as the Ruffello to bring supplies to the station. The crew of STS-102 used the Canadarm to berth the Ruffello to the station, then activated it and transferred cargo between Ruffello and the rest of the station. Once the transfer was complete, the crew then rebirthed Ruffello into the shuttle's payload bay. On a second spacewalk, the station's robotic manipulator arm, the Canadarm-2, was fully open and readied for use. The astronauts also attached additional power cables and conducted other outside maintenance. And like good tourists anywhere, uh, Chris takes a couple of pictures for us here, some happy snappies. And then we uh, take our last uh, good look at planet Earth, and it was time to call it uh, a day after about 15 hours of spacewalking on this mission. On April 29th, before leaving the station, Endeavour boosted the station's altitude with its reaction control thrusters. Then the crew bid farewell to Expedition 2, and the orbiter undocked from the station and performed a fly-around survey of the complex, recording views of the station with an IMAX camera. It's a very smooth and slow, very graceful movement away from the space station. And I can tell you at this moment, I was both very sad at leaving and also very proud to see this picture and the completion of our critical mission. 
We uh, undocked over to the Pacific, and uh, about uh, 10 minutes later, I looked down at maybe 100 feet out, and we were gliding over the Colorado Rockies, uh, where I grew up. A very neat experience. We continued then uh, up over the continental United States, up over Canada, which was very fitting uh, that we uh, pass over that great country as we depart. And I have to tell you, I, I looked at this and there was a little bit of a conflict in my head as my brain said, this is not possible, but my eyes were seeing it. And I can tell you that uh, it's really there. Two days later, Endeavour re-entered the atmosphere and landed on May Day of 2001. Um, at this point, uh, we are still going um, pretty fast, and uh, uh, as soon as we start uh, decelerating, we start feeling the effect of the uh, weight again. Well, the good news was the uh, weather was gorgeous at Edwards Air Force Base. The uh, bad news was it wasn't so good in Florida, so we made the right decision, or the right decision was made on the ground, and we came around. Uh, down here, you see the lake bed which is kind of fitting because 20 years and two weeks before we landed, the very first space shuttle with John Young and uh, Bob Crippen landed on that lake bed. We're coming down a, a steep glide path at 20 degrees, 300 knots. I was very proud of my pilot. You can see here he got the gear out at 400 feet above the ground. And here's a view again out the front window coming to this huge, beautiful runway. The, uh, we use the, the ball, the light on the left to help track down. That truck's not exactly where you think it is. It wasn't on the runway. Touchdown at 195 knots, where you got the shoot out again right away. Again, uh, Bones did a great job. And uh, we come kind of crashing down on the nose gear at this point and roll to a stop. And you saw the star, the twinkle there on the, uh, the glass. And I think definitely somebody was watching us throughout this mission because uh, it was 100% successful. It was a busy time at the ISS. Just a few hours after undocking, and before Endeavour had returned to Earth, the first space tourist arrived on the ISS. 